이튿날 요한은 예수님이 자기에게 나오시는 것을 보고 이렇게 말하였다. 보라, 세상죄를 짊어지신 하나님의 어린 양이시다. 내가 전에 내 뒤에 오시는 분이 계시는데 그분이 나보다 위대한 것은 나보다 먼저 계셨기 때문이다. 라고 말한 분이 바로 이분이시다. 나도 이분을 몰랐으나 이분을 이스라엘 백성에게 알리려고 내가 와서 물로 세례를 준다. 그러고서 요한은 이렇게 증거하였다. 나는 성령님이 하늘에서 비둘기처럼 내려와 이분 위에 머무시는 것을 보았다. 나도 전에는 이분을 몰랐다. 그러나 물로 세례를 주라고 나를 보내신 분이 나에게 성령이 내려와서 어떤 사람 위에 머무는 것을 보거든 그가 곧 성령으로 세례를 주실 분인 줄 알아라고 일러주셨다. 그래서 내가 그것을 보고 이분이 하나님의 아들이라고 증거하시는 것이, 증거하는 것이다. 요한복음 1장 29절부터 34절까지입니다. Good morning. Our scripture reading for this morning is John chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and on one hand, we're thankful because we can still worship you together, even though we're scattered throughout the city. So we thank you for that. And at the same time, Lord, we long to be together again in, in physical presence as well. Lord, I pray this morning that your spirit would bring us comfort. Lord, I pray that your spirit would bring us unity together. And I pray that you would enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth today. And as we look into your word this morning, I ask, Lord, that you'd help us to understand it clearly, to apply it well in our lives, and to go forward changed people, ready to do your will in this world today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before I get started, uh, I'd like to congratulate, congratulate, <laughs> Congratulate uh, John and Nikki, who were just married yesterday. So um, if you know where they are, go ahead and send them a message and say congratulations to them. It was a beautiful wedding. Now I'd like to start with a question. Do you have peace right now? Do you have peace right now? And I don't just mean peace as in the absence of war, but I mean in a more holistic way in your life, do you experience peace in your daily experience in life right now? The world today in its current situation, it seems like we've been robbed of a lot of the things that, that give us peace. There are many people who are sick, many people who are dying. And at the same time, right now, we haven't even begun to see the full effects of the economic outworkings of this virus in the world. I'm not sure if you all saw the news last week, but there was a point at which oil prices got so low that the U.S. could not give away the oil that they had. They actually had to pay people to take it away. That's the, that's the state of the world economy right now. It's in trouble. And there's a lot of people, a lot of us, who might have had our trust or our hope in financial things, and, and that trust and hope has been broken. So where is our peace? Well, as Christians, we know that ultimately our peace comes from God, that true peace only comes from God. But in order to receive the peace from God, we have to have peace with God first. 
And that's what we're going to find in this passage that we've just read today. How to have peace with God, and once you have that peace, how to have peace in your life um, and even in your community. This week we're continuing our series through the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is uniquely reflective and theological. He, he was much more concerned as a writer with putting Jesus at the center stage so that we'd focus entirely on him uh, in, rather than putting events in exact chronological order. What that does for us is it helps us to see different aspects of the truth about Jesus all right in front of us. Now John, he tended to stack metaphors on top of each other, and uh, he also made more references and allusions to the Old Testament than any other author in Scripture. And so as we go through the Gospel of John, that's what we're going to do as well. We're going to put Jesus at center stage and see what these different, uh, these different descriptions of him and metaphors for him teach us about him. And uh, we're going to be looking back into the Old Testament to see what, what John was alluding to. And then after all of that, we're going to be looking forward again to see how this is good news for us today. So we're continuing in the introduction of John's Gospel. And in John's Gospel here, we're introduced to John the Baptist. So I don't want us to get confused here. We actually have two Johns that we're talking about this morning. John the Evangelist who wrote the Gospel and then John the Baptist uh, who was giving his testimony about Jesus in this passage. His testimony about Jesus. So he reveals in the passage today that he knows Jesus as the Lamb of God and the Son of God. And so we're going to be looking at this morning how the Lamb, as the Lamb of God, Jesus gives us peace with God. And as the Son of God, who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, the peace of God comes into us. Okay, so first of all, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And this is what John was bearing witness to. Verses 29 to 31. The next day he, that's John the baptizer, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. So John the Baptist was a very interesting character. For one thing, um, we, we, we tend to read someone's name like this and, and think maybe his last name was Baptist, but um, that's not really what's going on, right? People, a lot of times um, in those days, and even you know, much later than that as well, would get some sort of description attached to their name so that you would know who you were talking about. Um, even in the Bible, you find people like uh, Mary Magdalene, right? Magdalene it refers to the place that she came from. Um, so, uh, and then also there's another place where uh, Jesus calls, Jesus calls, uh, let's see, there, there's Simon the Greater and Simon the Younger. <laughs> so there's a couple of Simons. They had to sort of figure all this out. So John, the thing that distinguished him as, as a person and as a prophet was that he was baptizing people in the river when they came out to see him. And he was baptizing, he was doing what he called a baptism of repentance. So he was commissioned by God, and this is the way he saw himself as well, to prepare the first followers of Jesus, to get them ready for Jesus' coming. And he himself, he identified himself with this voice in Isaiah chapter 40, that was alerting the people of that time to get ready because God was going to come. So then from verses 29 to 36, it seems like every time, so he's getting people ready for Jesus to come, and then he sees Jesus coming towards him, and he calls out with this extraordinary phrase. He says, behold, I mean, look, look! It's the Lamb of God. That, that's where our first puzzle comes to us as we come to the Word this morning. We have to work out what the Lamb of God is, how this relates to Jesus. What, we, what we're going to learn is that John the Baptist's prophetic application of an Old Testament metaphor to Jesus 
is going to reveal the most important aspect of who he is and what he came to do. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now, we've explored this theme before when we talked about Rahab's scarlet thread of hope. Um, I hope you remember that. And so this theme of the Lamb of God, it begins all the way back in Genesis chapter 22. Back then, uh, and this is what John and John the Baptist are alluding to in the Old Testament, it begins back in Genesis chapter 22 when Abraham was preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac at God's command. And we come all the way back to verses 7 and 8 of Genesis chapter 22. He says, Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they went, both of them, together. Now there's a, there's a possible double meaning in that phrase that Abraham said to his son that's sort of building up tension in that story. On one hand, Isaac himself was the son whom God had provided to Abraham. So were he to actually be sacrificed, Abraham's words would still have been true. God would provide the lamb for the sacrifice. But we know that's not what happened in the story. Instead, God provided an actual lamb to be sacrificed in place of Isaac. And this, what we find here, this is the first substitute sacrifice. The first time that, that one person's life was spared in return for another sacrifice the one that God provided. And this theme is expressed again and again throughout the rest of the Old Testament. I mean, we find it in the final plague of Exodus, and we had a sermon about that just a while back. But God commanded the people at that time, this is the last plague before they, left, before they got out of Egypt, God commanded the people to sacrifice a lamb, preparing it and eating it in a very specific way, and to paint its blood on the doorposts of their house. And every house whose doorposts were painted with lamb's blood was passed over by God's messenger of death. So God provided a way through the sacrifice of a lamb for the firstborn sons in Egypt, for the firstborns in general in Egypt, to be spared, to avoid this plague. Once again, in this theme, we find that a lamb was offered in place of a firstborn. And just like Isaac was unbound, the people of Israel were set, th set free through the sacrifice. And so this substitutional sacrifice, this idea of substitutional sacrifice was further revealed as the way to atone for sin, and it was codified into the law that God gave to Moses. We find this in well, one of the many places, but if we look in Leviticus chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, and this is, uh, this is God speaking through Moses, telling the people how to, um, how to make these sacrifices and what these sacrifices are for. He says, If he, a person, brings a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish, and lay his hand on the head of the sin offering, and kill it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering and put uh, with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out all the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. And all its fat he shall remove, as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it on the altar on top of the Lord's food offerings. And the priest shall make atonement for him for the sin which he has committed, and he shall be forgiven. The big problem of, for all of us, for all humanity, is that our sin both causes and requires our deaths. It causes it because we're separated from the life of God requires it because we've made ourselves objects of God's wrath. But God himself 
made a way for people to be forgiven for sin by substituting the death of other living things, including lambs, for those who trust him. Now, the blood of animals, as Paul says later in the New Testament, was never sufficient to atone for human sin. In fact, God designed this system of sacrifices to be incomplete until the day when he would provide the perfect sacrifice, when he would provide the Lamb of God to take away human sin. We talked about this in our series in Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, that whenever people made sacrifices like this, what they had to do is look forward in faith to the forgiveness of God, to exactly how he was going to accomplish that. Now, all of that background, all of that background is, is drawn in in that amazing proclamation of John the Baptist when he saw Jesus. When he saw Jesus, he said, look, there, there is the Lamb of God. There is the sacrifice that God has provided. And he says specifically, to take away the sins of the world. to take away the sins of the world, not even just the sins of the people of Israel, but the whole world. Now, it's not clear if even John the Baptist understood the full meaning of what he said at that time. That happens a lot with prophets, especially in Scripture, when they're speaking, they're, they're speaking the words that God gives them to speak, but it's not really known how, how huge those words are until much, much later when people look back on them. So I think that's what's going on here as well. John the Evangelist, the one who wrote the Gospel, was looking back at the words of John the Baptist and realizing that this was all about Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. That God himself provided the Lamb, provided Jesus, who is himself God in the flesh. And he entered history as a real man in order to die for our sin. A lot of people, I think, have difficulty with this idea, with the idea of substitutional sacrifice. In fact, some people have gone so far as to call it divine child abuse. But to say so, to look at it that way, is actually to completely misunderstand who Jesus is. Jesus says many times in the, in, the, in the Gospels, he says, I and the Father are one. He says, the, the Spirit proceeds from the Father, and then uh, he also says, and I'm going to send you the Spirit. It's really, really important for us to keep in mind and remember that, yes, there are three persons of the Trinity, but all three are God. So it's not like one has a plan and pushes the other one into it. That doesn't make any sense if you know who God is if you think about who Jesus is. And then we, when we think about from John's perspective as well, later on in the, in the book of Revelation, when he talks about Jesus there, he's, he's going to say that he hears this voice when he's standing in the throne room of God, and this voice says that the only one who can uh, basically open up the scroll and reveal all of God's plans for judgment and salvation is the root of Jesse and the Lion of Judah. And he's like, wow, that sounds really amazing. And so then he looks, and what does he see? He sees a lamb that was slain. And what that's teaching us is that it's part of Jesus' role and his character as the Son of God, even from the beginning, even from before creation, he is the lamb who was slain. That's who he is. He's the one who's going to sacrifice himself to save the people. Jesus lays down his own life as he said, and picks it back up again. God himself provided the lamb. Jesus became a real man. He died for our sin. His life in exchange for our lives. Peace with God is restored. And in Jesus, we are forgiven and we're reconnected with the life. So John the Baptist testified that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, he also testified 
that Jesus is the Son of God who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. So here we have a few more um, interesting metaphors going on here, and we're going we're gonna to try to work out what this is all about. So verses 32 to 34, John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, he, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now John knew that Jesus was the Son of God because he saw the Holy Spirit of God descend and remain on him. There's a few challenges for us here as well. First of all, how can one see the Holy Spirit? And what does the Spirit have to do with a dove? That's actually a really difficult one, and um, I, I've read several different commentaries on that, and nobody has any agreement on what dove has to do with the Holy Spirit. Um, so we don't really know what that connection is. But what we do know is that John recognized this physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit as the fulfillment of God's word. And so in this text, in this case, in, in John's testimony, the dove became a symbol of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus. And that's as far as we can go with it at this point. But it's still, it's an important symbol because the Holy Spirit did not just descend upon Jesus, he remained on Jesus. He descended and remained. So that the Spirit of God remained on him or is resting upon God's Son, it, it's clearly alluding, it's clearly alluding back to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. So he's, he's talking about uh, someone, who, someone who's going to come from the line of King David, right? Because David's father's name was Jesse. And a branch of his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So this prophecy is describing the Messiah who is going to come. The one whom God is going to send to save his people. And it's interesting the way he's described here. He's described in terms of, of ruling and, and judging his people. And so I think what's going on here is that this, this figure in Isaiah chapter 11 that John is alluding to in John chapter 1 is drawing a contrast between the past kings and judges of Israel and the Messiah whom God is sending into the world. And this is the contrast. The Spirit rests upon God's Messiah. The Spirit rests upon Him. In the past... We've read this in, in our series as well, that the Holy Spirit has come down upon a few different people. Um, one of them, for example, was Samson. The Spirit of God came upon him and basically turned him into a superhero for a little while, and he destroyed a whole army by himself. But that was only at specific times, for specific purposes. The Spirit did not remain on Samson all the time. And then, uh, for example, King Saul, when he first became king, the Holy Spirit came down upon him and he prophesied, but only once. The Messiah, on the other hand, would be permanently filled with the Holy Spirit. He'd be permanently, the, the Spirit would permanently rest upon him. And this Spirit would give him all the qualities of the perfect king. Wisdom, understanding, good counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. And so Jesus then is proven to be God's Messiah when, when John sees the Holy Spirit come down upon him like a dove and stay and remain on him. Permanently remaining upon him. And then furthermore, 
John, this, this shows John something else, that Jesus is going to baptize his people in the same Holy Spirit that remained upon him. Now, the natural question here is, well, what John and the other gospel writers mean by baptism in the Holy Spirit? The phrase is found just once in each gospel, that's in relation specifically to this event, and then two more times in Acts. Um, and those events, th those, those mentions are actually pointing back towards the baptism of Jesus as well. So, what do we actually mean by this? Well, if we actually translate the original Greek word into English, baptizo, we don't actually translate it. What we've done is we've, we've taken it from Greek and dropped it into English and, and said that's what it means. Well, what it means is when we put somebody in the water, that's baptize. Okay, well, what does it actually mean? It literally means to immerse something in something else. And so John, therefore, should be called John the Immerser. Or Jesus um, is the one also who will immerse people in the Holy Spirit. Now, I think if we think about it that way, the metaphor, it connects more easily with others that are found in the New Testament. Later in John's Gospel, John told his disciples to abide in him, to be immersed in him. And he promised that his spirit would abide in them as well. In Acts, the disciples were clothed with power when the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost. They were immersed in the spirit. So considering these and many other references, being immersed in the Spirit, it's a metaphor for God's transforming presence coming into our lives and, and, and in some sense burying us in His Spirit. There's another metaphor. <laughs> so our old selves then are buried, and we are slowly changed from the inside out so that we, we begin to take on more and more of the character of Jesus, because this is his spirit that he's sending to us. And so practically, this means, first of all, that we know God. In, in one of Paul's letters, he says that we are participating in the divine nature. That is, in the nature of God. We participate in that as his spirit, as we're immersed in his spirit. So we know God. And I think because of that, we also begin to bear the same sort of qualities as his servant in Isaiah 11, as the Messiah. We gain wisdom. We gain understanding. We, we have good, the good counsel of God with us. We have the strength to do his will. We're given, we're given humility before him. Galatians chapter 5 adds to this. It says that we're going to start producing fruit like a tree in a way. That what, when the Spirit is in us and around us, then what comes out of our lives is, is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Each one of us individually, as we're, in, as we're baptized in the Holy Spirit by Jesus, we become a new kind of people. And we're being made fit for God's kingdom. Now, back in Isaiah chapter 11, again, there is a glimpse of what life as these new people is going to be like. And what life under the authority of the Son of God is like. Verses 6 through 9. I love this. He says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra, and the wean child shall put his hand into the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. What God is portraying here through the prophet is a state of perfect peace. Perfect peace. The peace is not just the absence of war here. It is complete freedom from death, from fear, and from danger. I mean, the, the metaphor there is that you have lions and lambs laying down together. You have 
Uh, you have the other one was a a lion and a fattened calf laying down together. I mean, from a lion's perspective, that's food. <laughs> that's a good that's a good meal. But the lion is going to be laying down with the calf and eating straw like an ox. Okay, so well, I think what we're looking at here is not necessarily that you know one day actually lions will eat straw, but the point is that the predator and the prey. Like the predator's not trying to kill anyone, the prey is not afraid. And then you have a child, the, the weakest among all humanity, sticking his hand into a snake's hole. And the idea there is that there's just nothing for him to be afraid of. Nothing to be afraid of. No death, no fear, no danger. Life in perfect harmony with God's creation and all of its inhabitants. That is the whole world immersed or baptized in the knowledge of God as the waters cover the seas. That is the peace that Jesus came to create and to give to us. So, how is Jesus as the Lamb of God and the Son of God good news for us today? The answer is that he is our complete peace. Jesus sacrificed himself in our place so that we might move out from under God's wrath and have peace with God instead. So he gives us peace with God as the Lamb of God. And then his sacrifice is so complete, so complete, that if we trust in him, all of our past, our present, and our future sin is all atoned for. Think about that for a moment. What, is, what does complete peace with God mean to you? Whatever you've done in the past, Jesus paid for it, and God no longer brings it to mind. God doesn't bring it to mind, and neither should you, except maybe to tell others what God has done for you. And what about, then, sins that you haven't done yet? Things that are in the future. Well, Jesus paid for those in advance, too. You're already forgiven. You have peace with God. When you put your trust in Jesus, you're, it's like you've moved from one place to another place. You were under wrath of God. Now you're under peace of God. And it doesn't matter anymore what you've done before. You're going to have peace with God. Now, naturally, when we do sin... We have this freedom now to confess our sin to God, who's faithful and just, to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That brings us to how the Son of God, who immerses us in the Holy Spirit, is good news for us too. Jesus sends his Spirit to us to extend God's peace into every facet of our lives. Not only does he provide for our forgiveness, but God surrounds us and fills us with his presence so that we also become new people who are being made fit for his kingdom. Now, none of us are fit yet, but we're not who we used to be. That fills me with joy, too. I joke with my wife sometimes that, you know, and it's not really a joke, that if she had met me before God really got a hold of me, then she wouldn't have given me a second look. Praise the Lord that I'm not who I was before. Still not who I want to be, but I'm not who I was before. Slowly, slowly, every believer begins to produce the fruit of baptism in the Holy Spirit. We have love and joy and peace and patience and all the rest in ever-increasing measure. And then we also become a people of peace because we have a gospel of peace to proclaim. We have peace with one another, and we're peacemakers in the world. We have the gospel of the Lamb of God to proclaim so that more people would have peace with God and more people would be immersed in His Spirit and become part of our community. And so my encouragement for all of us today, as we're in a situation where it seems like a lot of our peace might be missing, just remember where our peace comes from. Jesus, as the Lamb of God, has given us peace with God. 
and he's baptized us with his Holy Spirit so that we would have the peace of God in us and we can now move forward and make peace with others and help them find peace with God too. And we keep doing that. We keep making peace with other people. And, you know, right now it, we can't get together with other people like we could before, but let's be creative. Think about how we can continue ministering the gospel to people. And all the while that we're doing this, we're looking forward to eternal, perfect peace in God's kingdom. Where we will then absolutely have no fear, no death, and no danger. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you sent your Son into this world to be our peace. Lord, we thank you so much that you have made the way for us to be forgiven of all of our sins. As John says, you take our sins away. They're gone. Lord, I want to pray for anyone among us us right now who is struggling with sin. Lord, your spirit, through your spirit, we have the power to overcome the sins in our lives. And I just pray that we would all be immersed in your spirit, that we'd be able to confess, that we'd be able to, that, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And at the same time, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace, because you know that we're going to mess up. And that's why you sent your perfect son to be sacrificed in our place. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would make this church and this people ministers of your peace. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to reach out with the gospel, even during this time of the coronavirus. Lord, help us to find new ways and be creative to get your message out. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would fill our lives, whatever it is that we're worried about or struggling about right now, Lord, I just pray that your peace would be with us, your perfect peace that passes all understanding. We commit ourselves into your hands once again. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.